Good morning, good afternoon, and good day wherever you may be joining us from. Welcome to another edition of the Digital Download. I've got this. All right. Which is the longest running weekly business talk show on LinkedIn Live, now officially syndicated through the IGBN radio network. So close. Ah, damn. Close. The IBGN oh. internet radio network. And, and now syndicated on TuneIn Radio. Every time you think you got it, I'm going to change it on you, Adam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it would seem more. So it would seem. That's all right. Uh, that's because we keep growing. Today, we're going to discuss serenity in leadership. And with the week that I've had, serenity sounds like a good thing. <laughs> We have a special guest, Tom Dennis, to help us with the discussion. Uh, with over three decades of experience in transforming uh, corporate cultures and promoting psychological safety, Tom provides actionable insights on nurturing inclusive environments and balancing leadership energies. But before we bring Tom on, let's go around the set and introduce everyone. While we're doing that, why don't you in the audience reach out to a friend, ping them, and have them join us? We strive to make the digital download an interactive experience, so audience participation is highly encouraged. All right. Uh, with that, introductions. Adam, would you kick us off, please? Hello, everybody. I'm Adam Gray. Uh, I'm co-founder of DLA Ignite. And... Uh, I'm very much looking forward to this. In fact, every week I'm looking forward to this because we always have great guests, don't we? That we do. Excellent. Welcome. Tim. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, um, my name is Tim Hughes. I'm CEO and co-founder of DLA Ignite. Um, and I'm famous for writing the book, Social Selling, Techniques to Influence Bias and Changemakers. Excellent. Thank you very much. And myself. That's your introduction up. Yes, I'm Rob Durant, founder of Flywheel Results, a proud DLA Ignite partner, and I'm not famous for writing anything yet. Yet. <laughs> we also have um, an audience member checking in. Uh, Serenity Disco says, hi, friends. Excited to learn more about today's topic. Hi, Serenity. Thanks for joining us. As I said, this week on the Digital Download, we'll speak with Tom Dennis, CEO of Serenity in Leadership. With a background that spans from the Royal Marines to becoming a change agent and leadership coach, Tom has dedicated his career to fostering inclusive, psychologically safe workspaces and championing the championing, can't get it, championing the balance of masculine and feminine energies in leadership. <laughs> there, nailed it. Excellent. All right. Tom, welcome. And thank you for being a part of this morning's show. <laughs> thank you. Thank you indeed. It's good to be here. <clears throat> Tom, let's start by having you tell us a little bit more about you, your background, and what led you to where you are today. <clears throat> Um, well, uh, I've had a, a, a varied background, I, uh, which, which really was um, influenced quite substantially um, from my early days at, at boarding school, where I experienced a, um, a headmaster who uh, abused his uh, position uh, and um, it, it, le it, it, it led me to sort of have, as I, as I grew up, um, this sense of justice. What is justice? What is fair? What is right? Uh, and, um, and a kind of sense of outrage at the abuse of power that certain people have when they are in positions of power. Uh, and, and really that... Um, it, it almost became dormant during the Romarines because, on the whole, the standard of leadership was extremely high. Not always, but but very very often. But when I came into the corporate world, 
um, I, I began again to see uh, people in power who uh, didn't know how to, to, to wield that with any sense of responsibility. And therefore, I, it, it sort of, I think, awakened um, this old hurt in me. And I really became very determined to try and help leaders who've got incredibly difficult jobs, CEOs, incredibly difficult jobs. But how could they do those and, and, and bear responsibility for the outcome of their actions on the people and now more recently, of course, the, the environment? So um, in, in, a, in a sort of a nutshell, that's, that's really um, sort of a, a outlining my purpose and my passion. Um, so when I started out um, in the corporate world, which was back in 1991, I, I said, I bring healing into business. Um, because I actually, had, between uh, leaving the Royal Marines and going into the corporate world, I, I became a Reiki uh, a master, sort of learning about the, the energy healing um, and, uh, and and then uh, set up my first uh, consultancy. And so over a period of time, it, it sort of morphed into making organizations psychologically safe for people to work in. Um, and that only happens when you have a leadership that ha has that sense of responsibility, I think. I, I can only imagine that... Um in 1991 when you spoke about healing in business and you can see where this comment's going healing in business and safe spaces people must have looked at you like you had just come from another planet you know the spaceships come down and out comes out comes tom who talks about all this mumbo jumbo and now of course it's it's kind of normal parlance isn't it it's, it's normal conversation within organizations but in those days i mean i remember my working life in 1991 if i'd have said uh oh you know i feel a little bit unsafe in this environment someone would have just punched me yes to show that he was you were right uh, i do remember <laughs> quite early on um being asked to facilitate a um a corporate meeting of the board of directors <laughs> in a, a a place uh just north of london and it was, it was, I think the place had been built in the 1500s or something. It was very old. And when I went in there, I thought, God, the energy in this place stinks. It's awful. Um, and so I, 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 br I brought some crystals with me and I was just putting them around, <laughs> uh, around the sort of corners of the room. And one of the directors came in. He thought I was planting microphones. <laughs> 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 so... I wasn't quite sure which way to go with that, which was easier to explain. <laughs> uh, yes. Tom, is it, there's, a, there's a saying, isn't there, Tom, which is that the power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yes. And, and you know, I, I think I think we're seeing examples of that um, in, in the world today, aren't we? Where where governments are becoming more and more powerless and more and more beholden to uh, the leaders in very large organizations. Um, that might be controversial, but that's how I see it. And um, it's, and, and you, cause, cause I remember when, um, I went through the world of, of corpro and it was, you acted the way that everybody always acted or kind of the way that there was, that you were expected that you thought that you were expected to act. Um, and I remember, um, a good friend of mine going for a meeting and, um, probably would have been in um, something like 1990, something like that. Um, and um, he was explaining um, that, that, that maybe the job wasn't exactly how he wanted it to be. Um, and maybe we should do, he should do something different. And the manager just said, said just, I won't use the word beginning with F, um, get on with it. Now, yeah. clearly 30 years have gone, uh, water has, has gone under the bridge and it's very different from that. Um, but certainly in those days, it was how you were expected to act. You, as a as a leader, you just turn around and tell people to to just get on with it. And there are still organisations like that. I think. That, yeah, that... yeah, yeah, yeah. There's still a lot of organisations that are very command and control, top down, and mm. stuff like that. Um, 
and and I think that that it, it still exists. Yeah, there's uh, we're we're in a uh, we're in a fascinating situation. Um, I've been asked to speak uh, to a, a group of head teachers uh, soon about resilience and 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 well being, um, and I. Honestly, I don't know very much about the educational system um, now. I'm I'm sort of kind of out of touch with that. But I, I've been doing a little bit of research, and 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 there's this resurgence of a very autocratic way of running uh, schools now, which I had no idea about. Which, funny enough, originated well, not funny enough. It's it's not that surprising. Originated in the U.S. Um, with this word slant, um, and. Uh, I, I'm, so we've got this um, continuum, I guess, from the the, the really sensitive and um, caring uh, and soft approach, if you like, to, to the way you, you you teach, going right the way across now to something that wouldn't be that uncomfortable for Genghis Khan and and, and his ilk. Um, and uh, I, I think that's really interesting because I, I, I mean, they're, they're getting very good results, you know, depending on how you measure these things um, on the autocratic end. And I'm wondering what, what's going to happen with those people when they go out into, into business, um, because that's very unlike what typically is described as the Gen Z um so so if we if if we we we've kind of talked about what our experience is and and what they've been what is it that we should be doing you know if 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 we think about i mean i think that everybody who watches this show wants to come to, wants to come to work and be their best selves because that's kind of the culture that we've tried to to set and try and, and talk about it's what i do i know it's what adam does and i know what i, I know rob does it as well and we and, and we don't always get it right, and but we'd like to. But so, what is it that we can be doing as leaders to set the psychological safety for people, to make people people feel empowered, to make people want to come to work and come to work maybe for us or certainly the leaders that are watching. Tom, before you answer that, because I do want to hear that answer, can you please clarify first what is meant by psychological safety? and then share with us how we would go about as a leader and implement that? Um, I think people feel psychologically safe when they can be themselves. Um, and it's, it's a sort of a, it's an element of inclusion. When, um, w w when you're in an environment where you feel like you can say something and you're not going to be crucified for it, uh, and that uh, uh, it, it, it may be it may be silly. It may be a, a huge mistake. And if you make a huge mistake, then you're not going to be vilified for that. You're going to be maybe encouraged or uh, the in, in, encouraged to to look at um, where where is that decision taking us? I, I mean, I, I often do this in coaching where I, I, it's it's not about saying, no, you're wrong. This is the way to do it. It's OK. If you do that, then tell me about the consequences or um, you might be coming up against this challenge. How would you go through that? So you're you're developing the person's um, uh, uh, um, agency in that awful word, but um, uh, and uh, helping them feel like they by being themselves warts and all it's okay um so yeah yeah and and, and that that's what leads to a sense of real team and inclusion which are so important um i think you know the, the moment you don't feel safe you're gonna hold back you're gonna kill uh, innovation you're gonna kill creativity it's it's uh it, it, it's not a nice place, but it's a place that an awful lot of people are very used to, uh, unfortunately. Adam and I did some uh, work, um, are doing some work at the moment with um, Salesforce, the CRM vendor. Mm. And we happen to be working with a part of a team um, uh, of, of a person who is a particularly, what I would call an inspirational leader. 
and the team is just amazing we have it's it's a you know real diverse team um there's it, it, there's just an energy that comes from it mm. and and all the different personalities it's what it's 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 just like you know when you talk about um in inclusion and diversity and, and and that that should be the driver for innovation sitting there this week sitting to that listening to that team from salesforce i i just felt the energy of it mm -hmm. yeah um so anyway my um, my question was how do we how do we how do we create this tom well perhaps you should ask the leader of that team but <laughs> we should get her on actually her, her name's not vicky is it no, it's not that. No. Yeah, because I, 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 that's one of the Salesforce people that I know, and I. I oh, I, I know Vicky Salesforce. As well. I, I, I can, I can imagine her creating the same sort of environment. Um, I think the first thing is, uh, you know, we can talk about uh, knowing one's, knowing oneself. Uh, I, I really feel like the key leadership skill for the future, for now, uh, and and the future is self awareness. So. Uh, understanding, because if, if you really understand yourself and you understand your drivers and your beliefs and your values and all those kind of things, uh, and you come a, a, into the environment with a, a level of humility and vulnerability, then you, you know that you don't know lots of things. And um, if you can be authentic about that and say, uh, I, I, I come into this, I'm, I'm not the all-knowing leader, because I, I think in the past, leaders felt like they had to, um, by showing any sense, t type of weakness, that they would not be respected. And therefore, they used to, uh, that, I mean, that's where all the d directive stuff ca came in. I, I mean, it's fascinating how many directive leaders are actually d leading from a place of fear. So yeah. um, let's, let's just... Um, uh, <laughs> use the the dangerous word love ourselves, and know that we have foibles we have biases um we, we're human <laughs> uh, and therefore uh, there will be uh, that's why i like I, I like to get a leadership team um sitting in a circle because there's there's very little hierarchy in a circle and you know, this this whole concept of you put a little table in the middle of the circle and it's like somebody um, it has a problem and they get up and they go and almost metaphorically put it on the table. This is my problem. And they go back and they, you know, we talk about it and they sit back and then somebody gets up and says, I'll pick that up for the moment because I, these are, this is my area of expertise. And when I, I'm, I'm, um, I, I've, I've done my bit, I put it back in the middle and somebody else picks it up. And, you know, the, the leader might just have set that up. And allow it to flow because he's he or she is not uh, concerned for their ego that they somehow have got to show themselves up to be in command or in charge they they let that go and the leadership is that creating of the the space where it's sufficiently safe for people to uh, take risks uh, and um, allow what emerges and sometimes you've got to say whoa hang on we're, we're going a bit off of peace here let's let's go back or it, it looks like we're going off peace but i'll let it run because i'm curious as to where it's going to go whatever uh it, it's it's allowing you mentioned being um authentic to your beliefs and values do you coach people in the sense of helping them discover theirs or do you expect them to come to the, these meetings and such already knowing it? I, I don't think one should ever expect anything uh, <laughs> I, I, and, and, and and nor judge uh, and I think that's one of the secrets of a, a good coach is to create an environment which is non-judgmental and that sometimes can be quite difficult but the more that one knows oneself, the less that interferes. So no, I, I, I think that um, I think what you meet people where they are. And if they're going into something where 
you know, it might be controversial or whatever. You might say, well, look, let's spend an hour just checking out where you're at. What are your beliefs and values? What are you bringing into the room? And how do they resonate or not with where you want to go? That, that might be the start point. Yeah, I, I think there is there is a huge amount of ego in leadership, isn't there? And, uh, and you know, throughout my career, I have seen countless examples of, of people that are leading organizations or leading teams that are, as we said, you know, they're, they're terrified of being seen to be anything less than perfect. Mm. And uh, I mean, th this is something that is shifting. I, I think that the, we as an organization are very good at saying both to internally and to the people that we work with, you know, you know more about this than I do kind of attitude. And, and certainly when I've been the recipient of that sort of behavior i've i've it's certainly made me feel much closer to the person that is leading um but it's still it, it seems not even though it, it, this is these, these are well-trodden paths it still seems not to be the norm doesn't it at the moment yes and i i mean i think a, a classic example of this is is uh looking at the way that um mps behave um I, I remember doing a um, a retreat uh, some years ago, which was led by a, um, a, someone who'd been trained by Osho in the old days. And, and he started every single workshop with an hour's dynamic meditation. I don't know if you've ever done dynamic meditation, but I tell you, it's, it's incredibly hard work, unbelievably hard work. You know, at the end of this session, everybody goes off and, and you know, they have a shower or um, whatever. And then you come back and you, you're, you're so sort of grounded. Mm. Uh, and I, I, I sort of had this, this sort of fantasy at the time thinking, my God, if everybody um, uh, had to go through this process before they sat down in the House of Commons, what a different place it would be. Um, because... At, uh, I mean, it, it, and, and at one level, that's just preparing them in the moment. But they're not trained. They're not. They're not taught how to lead. Um, you know, it's just they bring in whatever experience they've had in life, which might it's, be. A, isn't isn't that the same with isn't that the same with a lot of people within with not just people in in government, and you know we're a global show, so not just people in government in the UK, but it, but 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 certainly across industry, which is, you know, what happens is you take. Your best salesperson or your best engineer or your you know the best person and you make them the leader yeah um and and what they're used to is that they're used to selling pr probably you know for the classic is is you take a, a lone wolf salesperson and suddenly say you know what you like doing every day which is going out and selling stuff and keeping to yourself well now you're not going to sell anything but you've got to look after people yeah yeah, and it's extraordinary. I mean, it is such a common, such a common thing that, that uh, you know, people are promoted because they're good at something, mm. which bears no relationship to where they're being promoted. So it's, <laughs> and you think about it, and you think, where, where's the logic? Because <laughs> <laughs> if, if you take some of the best football managers or soccer managers, um, if you take some of the football, best football managers, they're actually they they actually weren't very good at football. They played it, but they weren't necessarily particularly good at it. Yeah. But when they went into management, they understood the situation. But what they understood was that they understood the lead leadership dynamic, which was different from actually having to play. Yes, Ab absolutely, completely mm. agree. Sorry, we have a comment from. Rob Turrell, it says, would like to hear your thoughts, read board versus leadership, safe space or straight out of succession? I assume he's referring to the TV show. Uh, the board may only get to meet nine times a year and include external investors and NEDs. The CEO and CFO often face a different culture at board to the one they face uh, or the one they may show as leaders. So a NED is a non-executive director. There we go. Thank you. There's a whole number of different things in there. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, 
Um, I think one of the difficulties with NEDs is that that an awful lot of them, um, you know, ha have got six, seven, eight active positions that they're they're um, filling at the moment, and that's, you know, you get to a certain level in your career, and then you 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 take on all these NED things, and they call it a portfolio of of directorships. Um, and I, I mean, I, I've been the, the non-exec chairman of a, a sort of medium-sized company some years ago. Ooh, and that was hard work. It was hard work, um, really. Um, and I, I, was, I had so much to learn on the job on that. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know which way to, to go with this question. It, it, I, I think that um, one of my experiences is that um, boards are actually quite distant from the executive team quite often. And uh, there's a there's a there's a dysfunction on the board which tends to filter in into the executive team, and of course it depends which members of the executive team are on the board as well, um, and how strongly um, an executive can hold his or her position in both camps because they are they can be very very different camps. Um, <sighs> Yes, the CEO and CFO often face a different culture at board to the one they may show as leaders. That's right, and that's wrong, if you see what I mean. It, it, it shouldn't be like that. Um, I, I think um, an interesting reflection is um, Frederick Laloux and his book, um, what's it called, Reinventing Organizations, where he, he, he uh, has taken a, a examples of a number of different companies around, uh, in Europe particularly, and shown how, uh, by really caring um, uh, and, and creating this sort of freedom of, of um, I mean, the example he gives is um, that, that, I, that I remember is uh, home care um, visitors in Holland. Uh, and th this company, which had all these, these visitors, took over and um, they set all these strict timings f so that you you could only spend so much time on an injection and only so much time on on doing a bandage and, and all this kind of stuff and uh, um, what happened and and there was in order to be efficient you'd have different people going to visit the same person uh, uh, and and the, the the client satisfaction went right down because there was no care. There was no time to have a conversation. There was no relationship anymore, uh, and um, so they they turned it round, uh, and and you know did what you know in in so many senses is sensible apart from the data driven, money driven attitude, which was killing everything. Um, and and w one of the things he says is that when you try and change the culture of an organization in that way. <clears throat> Very often it's the board that gets in the way because they are so terrified of letting go of a standard model that they understand that they don't let the company change. And he said the best way to do this is to set up a new company with a new culture and go from there. And, and it's just so much easier. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. I've seen some dreadful boards full of very, very grand fromage people. So, I don't know. It's interesting to me that you said the data drove their actions. And because there was no measure of relationship or the return on investment, mm. because there was no measure of the return on investment in relationship or humanity, it got neglected it, it got disregarded completely is there a way to measure for humanity how would an organization go about doing that well talk to the customer for a start uh <clears throat> you know i i get a i get a a delivery of organic food each week um and they've gone this way they've got 
you know, you, they send you a text and say, oh, we're going to deliver. And, oh, um, uh, th 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 this is the time slot with, with which we're going to deliver and, and all this kind of stuff. But <clears throat> you talk to the drivers, <clears throat> they're miserable because uh, they used to have the same route uh, and so on. And now th it's a computer or an AI that's driving them. Um, and and you get these ridiculous texts that say, "Oh, we're going to deliver," and it, it, in and it's 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 about within about three minutes they're going to deliver. And, it, <laughs> and you know, one phones up the, the the headquarters and they say, "Yeah, I'm sorry, we're you know we don't have the flexibility we used to have because we've got this new system." <laughs> Hello. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've, this, we've, this, we've improved it with a new system. Yeah. which now doesn't tell you when we're going to deliver until just as we're delivering. And there's, a, there's the famous thing, isn't there, that the um, Amazon drivers don't have time to go to toilet. Yeah. So yeah. They, they have their own ability to do it on in the, in the vans on, on um, as they're driving around. Yeah. Well, you know... Because there's this, there's this prankster guy that's actually then sold the contents of what they... Um, on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> if, you Google, if you Google it, it he, he was walking around. He walked past this Amazon, big Amazon warehouse. He couldn't understand what this yellow liquid in these bottles were all around the. Because what happens is that if they get caught with it in in the van, they get fined. So as they come into the um, warehouse, they throw it out the window. So there's all this li yellow liquid in the, these bottles. So he basically thought it'd be a great prank to buy all that. <laughs> Put a label on it and then sell it on Amazon. If you Google it, you'll find if you'll find it. <laughs> and it's you know, like there's this um, these drinks from these um, energy drinks in um, from these that have been promoted by influencers. It looks like one of those um, one of those. Drinks. Doesn't taste quite so good though. I, I, I don't know. What... <laughs> it might be nice, <laughs> but you know, not going to try and find out though. But by extension, you can you can say, what is it that is preventing governments and and large organisations for actually doing what is necessary to to play their part in uh, tackling global warming and. You know, it, maybe it's just only metaphorical. Maybe it's actually real. But it, it's like we've so lost touch with, on one side, humanity, on the other side, nature. You know what? Um, we, if we're we're so out of out of touch. I'm 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 not a vegetarian. I, I mean, I do eat some meat, but um, I, I remember. Um, doing some work for an abattoir some years ago and actually wanting to go there and see the place and, and feel it uh, and um, understanding um, the, the, what actually is entailed in getting what you see on the supermarket shelf. Um, and it's like, we need to do that. We, we we need to do that, and uh, I, I mean I, I did a I did a workshop so, some some while ago where um, p p part of the workshop was actually to to see um, an animal uh, um, sacrificed uh, and how the whole process worked to the evening meal where you actually actually ate what you had seen and it's like you you had that whole sense of a continuum which is which is so natural if it's done um with respect you know you look at the indigenous people and they have such respect for their environment such because they see themselves as part but just part of the whole and i think that what where we've got to in 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 so many societies now is that we think we're bigger we think we're better and uh, we and we don't have to obey the natural laws and cycles and and um 
I think that's just sad. Uh, and it does lead to these inhumane decisions that w we, we, are, we are taking. And it, in losing sight of this, it, it, it creates a vacuum in, within which we can make decisions which are um, which are not intra in the interests of actually anybody except for mammon. Uh, well, I, I think what you said is is a really good metaphor for the way that you know at a macrocosm, it's the way that we interact with our environment as a species on the planet. And in a microcosm, it's within a company, isn't it? So it's like yes. I'm going to I'm going to drive increased efficiency within my company at whatever cost in order that I can make more money, and then people become unhappy and they take more time off sick and they leave, and staff churn increases and morale decreases, so work rate decreases. So the very goal that you've chased, your behaviour has driven that goal out of the door. And actually, you're then fighting a rearguard action, aren't you, to try to salvage stuff because so much of it is is broken, particularly the trust between the organisation or the leadership and the people that work within the organisation. And and I think there's, there's, the same, there's a famous saying, isn't it, that the beat, beatings will continue <laughs> until morale increases. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But, but you know, I, I think that's 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 very true. And but I, I think w one of the things that's that's interesting is that every now and again, you know, we talk to an organisation, and it's clear that that they are trying to do more than just assess the numbers on a balance sheet. Clearly, that's part of the purpose of the business is to make money, and clearly, what they're trying to do is to uh, is to make as much money as they possibly can. But they realize it's not the only measure of success and there are other things that need to happen because a they're profitable long term to do but also b because they're the right thing to do and we're, we're starting to see more of that but it's still a long way to go i think yeah I, you, you know I, I often talk about patagonia um and as an organization um it, it's an organization i've got such deep respect for but if you talk to them, and I, I did a podcast interview with um, the guy who used to be the, the, the head of HR, uh, and and he he kind of he, he scoffed. He said, "Appraisals? We don't have appraisals. You know, if if you've got something to say, you say it. You know, it's just it's part of the whole culture. ROI? We don't we don't bother. We don't, and nobody ever talks about ROI, uh, and yet it's a two point two billion dollar organization." where now it's populated, I don't know what percentage, by people whose parents work there and as children they were in the crash. Uh, yeah, my, my daughter bought me this for Christmas, the, the book of the founder of, of Patagonia. Talking about, yeah, yeah, what his, uh, what his, his, uh, his vision was for it and how he has operated the organisation. And it's really interesting, isn't it, that, that all of his massive wealth. Have you his got one of those as well? One, well, let my people go surfing. Yeah, uh, which was his uh, yeah. first book. Yeah. Yeah. And then he, yeah. he wrote a book called the, the Responsible Company. And what I really liked about that was he said people um, are looking to make a, a say that their company is sustainable. And he said, there is no such thing. There is no such thing as a, a sustainable business. We all take out more than we put in. So what we've got to be is responsible. Sorry, Adam, I, I, I cut you off. No, there. no, I think that's ab absolutely right. Um, I, I, and you look at the... <clears throat> ah, dear. I mean, um, crashes and, and um, caring for, for people and the, them as human beings, not just as workers. I mean, I was talking to, to Dean, uh, this guy, Dean Carter, uh, recently, and he had, he had a statistic that the ROI on... Um, uh, I, I, I can't remember exactly what it was. It was the um, sort of family leave and, and in, integrating families into the in, into the business. The ROI was six hundred and thirty percent, roughly. Uh, and, and it's like, hello, that sounds like a no-brainer, and, and yet, and yet, so few organisations do it. Uh, and it's like, well. 
why not it's because they're scared they're scared of stepping out they're scared of losing control this 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 whole sense of i need to be in control i've got to i've got to prove myself as this this leader or this really good manager uh, and, and and actually i mean that you know the, the rob you, 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 that's where the serenity comes in you know how, how how can we be serene as leaders uh, if you if if you're really and i'm not claiming i am a great serene leader I, but I, I do aspire to that um but it, it, when you're coming from that place of serenity then you're allowing not driving or not managing you're allowing and and things come together in a completely different way maybe it wasn't the way that you planned but actually it's rather beautiful but but how do you convince leaders because this this is a mind shift and, and it's a it's a polar opposite from where many leaders are, uh, are positioning this because the impression that i get is that leaders have of many organizations have um they've worked their way up through the ranks they've they've had to battle they've had uh they've had to work 100 hours a week They've had to do all of these things that, that we think are totally unacceptable now. And then they get to the top of the tree and they say, I had to work 100 hours a week when I was your age to get to this position. Now you're bloody well going to do it as well. And we see that a lot in professional services companies, yeah. you know, where in order to be promoted to a partner in, in the practice, uh, you have to bill 2,000 hours a year or 2,500 hours a year, which is, you know, extremely difficult to do. And yeah. why do you have to do that? We have to do that because I had to do that. Yeah. And it proves your commitment to the business. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> I mean, what that brings up for me is something slightly different, but it, um, in, in, the, in, the, in, in the world of the law, um, uh, so many um, pupillage barristers um, have to go through this this sort of uh, um, sort of initiation of being abused in some way, and and it's getting better. But still, the misogyny that's displayed is completely horrific. But when you when you talk to a senior woman barrister, she'll say, "Oh yeah, you know, they're pinching the bottom and and all that kind of thing." You know, you've got to have a sense of humor. You've just got to get over it. Uh, and 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 they when if they get through all that they get to the top and then they look back and they say and when people, when there's this tendency it doesn't always happen but this tendency for for them to then to say to the young people oh look just grin and bear it get through it and it'll be all right as opposed to saying that I had to endure that but it doesn't mean to say that you have to and, do, and it's, don't you think that the Me Too um, uh, movement has has helped change that or or at least um helped with people realizing that it's wrong well yes and uh because i think there's a huge pushback now i think there's an awful lot of people who you know that this this resistance you've you you've seen it in 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 the political world here in the nhs in lots of organizations where they're doing away with de anything to do with dei bin it we don't have it we're not going to spend any money on it anymore uh and uh so uh i, I mean my, my next next podcast uh, where i'm just putting it together the the title is the dei backlash so, because i i think um uh that for all sorts of reasons um you know me too was a moment like like um, george floyd was a moment uh and it it caused all sorts of ripples in 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 the 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 the, the water if you like um but rather like the pandemic there are still people who who are now saying oh look thank god the pandemic so let's get back to normal uh and and so there is this you're getting both here and i and one of the comments says is this a mckinsey and bain logic that does not allow this to happen uh, to a degree i think that's right but I, I think that um the 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 business schools have got a lot to answer for here because i i i i really have a sense that a lot of them are still um 
blinkered in this, you know, EBITDA. If you, if you understand what EBITDA really is, uh, then you're going to be fine. As opposed to, um, uh, let's really understand. I, I, I think that um, systemically, we, we've got to look at things systemically. What's, what's really going on, not on the surface, but really deep down. And if we can address that, then we're going to get somewhere. But you've got to be flexible in order to do that. You've got to, um, you know, like I say, take time, go out and smell the flowers, smell the roses, and 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 ask yourself: Is is what I'm trying to do really in 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 some sort of alignment with something bigger than just me or bigger than the organisation? And I think being formulaic in the way that you approach change, or formulaic in the way that you introduce a strategy. Um, will tend to produce results from a financial point of view quite quickly, but from a human point of view, very often the, the longer term results are actually not what you're looking for at all. But, but you, you, you made reference then to business schools. And uh, one of the things that, that Tim and I hate is the expression best practice. Because the point with best practice is that you're following what someone else has determined should be done, which means that by nature of the fact it's best practice, you're a follower rather than a leader in terms of how you're shaping your business. And I think that so much of the thinking that we see in business schools and in marketing qualifications um, is based on the way things used to be. You know, we've got a very different demographic of people that are in the business world, both as consumers and as business people. We've got a digital first way of everything that we touch, how we shop, how we engage with people, how we communicate with people, how we build networks and, and forge relationships with people. And yet we still talk about digital marketing as if print marketing and t has any relevance at all in the modern world, which of course it doesn't. And the problem is that so many of these houses of cards are built on what are now fallacies. You know, it's the way, you know, you, you work eight hours a day, five days a week, 40 hours a week. That's what you work. You know, you build a campaign which is multi-channel, which includes email and telephone and advertising on billboards. And it's like, it's madness, utter madness. And yet that's just the way it's always been. So that's mm. how we need to do it. And this stuff is taught. So young people are coming out of having got their, their marketing degree and they understand how to buy radio media. I mean, what relevance does that have? It, absolutely zero, but it's still being taught. Hmm. And and so much of, of this is, <clears throat> you know, and, and we quote this quite a lot about the, the guy that's driving along in his car and he pulls over in the town that he's never been to before. And he says, excuse me, can you tell me how to get to Main Street? And the guy says, well, I wouldn't start from here if I were you. <laughs> and, and, you know, the point is that, that we're in a really bad place in so many elements of business and education because nine tenths of what's being taught is completely irrelevant today isn't it mm. yeah 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 <clears throat> yes I, I i i saw that one of the um the comments here was uh, how do you do this to john sir harvey uh, jones uh, uh troubleshooter management by walkabout in this hybrid world i think it's a great question um uh, and so, it, for our um, global audience, Tom, do you want to explain who Sir, Sir Harvey Jones is? Um, he was. Um, he, he really came to fame when he was uh, the CEO of, of um, ICI, which was the biggest chemical uh, company. And then he he uh, he had a TV program, didn't he? That um, I can't remember what it was called now. But it was called Trouble at the Top. Right. He was. He was a kind of. Um, a troubleshooter, you'd go into organizations and, and sort them out. And, and I, it, it's very interesting because I, I, I've, uh, with lots of my sort of CEO coaching clients, um, uh, it really encouraged them to get out from behind their desk and go and um, walk around and talk to people. Um, and it's amazing the difference that that can make from all sorts of, all sort of uh, directions. But now in a hybrid world, I think one of the ch one of the things that they can do is to say if you're coming into the office you are not to do emails. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, 
part, part of the whole point of having meetings is to create com community. And so uh, um, what we, we need to do is to, to have spaces where people can get to know each other and talk to each other, uh, uh, preferably in an in, in informal environment. That, Tom, that is the best idea I have heard in 2024 so far. If you're going to come into the office, you're not allowed to send emails because you can do that from home. I think that's just absolutely inspired. <laughs> well, yeah. It, 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 one of the challenges, of course, is that that, that if if you're hybrid and, and you know one person's in 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 uh, Tucson in Arizona and, and and one person is in Weybridge in in Surrey in the UK, you've still got that challenge. But I think there are things that you can do to explore. You know, one of the difficulties is when you're in a meeting uh, online, the people who are physically together, uh, at the end of the meeting, they go and get a coffee together and they, they continue a conversation, which doesn't happen for the people who were cut off. Mm. Uh, and and that's a I think that's a real challenge. But I think there has to be a way of um, uh, de 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 decompressing somehow so that the, the meeting ends, but you can still have interactions even online um, to, 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 to enable this somehow. Um, and, and really being caring about how people feel uh, and, and stuff like that, you know, starting with how are we feeling? Let's, 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 let's be humans before we're business people. Mm. Well, well, Rob's put a really interesting comment up there. No email, no screen time at all. Whiteboard's much more useful than yellow sticky notes. And whilst you may or may not agree with that, I actually do agree with that. I think whiteboards are a fantastic tool. I think the key point is that uh, digital should be a platform for speeding things up and for enabling you to scale and do stuff irrespective of distances and times. Unfortunately, though, we see it as a replacement for things, don't we? So I'll send you an email rather than phone you up, or I'll uh, I'll arrange an online meeting rather than knock on your door and, and go to your office. And actually, I think that the, what we need to do is we need to, to think, as you said, about the human things, you know, and that we should be using these technologies to bring us closer together rather than to replace human interaction. I, this is maybe a side thing, but I, I think it's really interesting that I was hearing a teacher the other day say that kids, when they're playing a game, uh, they can't go and do it together in the same house. They've got to be separate in their own space in order to play the game together. If they go, if they're in the same space, they can't do it. And it's like we're training kids to be separate and not to to. To, to learn about human interactions without technology. <clears throat> mm. uh. Tom, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you. How can people learn more about you? How can they get in touch with you? Well, um, please email me, Tom with an H, uh, Tom at serenityinleadership.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on um, and Serenity's on Instagram and and uh, you know uh, not TikTok. <laughs> All the platforms except yes. um, TikTok. And you know I'd I'd love to ha continue the conversation. I, and I suppose that just to, to, to finish this sense of um, particularly CEOs have got such difficult jobs today, such difficult jobs, because there's so much more that they're being asked to, to be to manage and to be responsible for. Um, and I, I think that if there are ways in which we can help them, I really love to do that because it's so hard for them. Um, I don't want to, to people to feel like it's, it, they're wrong. It's just, how, how can you be better when, there's so much pressure and so much demands on you. You don't have the space to do anything. So get in touch. Um, yeah, and, and LinkedIn's a good place. I like that approach. It's not right or wrong. It's just how do you get better? Mm. Excellent. Brilliant. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, Rob, Tim. If you uh, have something to say, we want to hear from you. 
scan the QR code on screen or visit us at digitaldownload.live and fill out the Be Our Guest application form. On behalf of the panelists, to our guest Tom, to our very active audience today, thank you all, and we'll see you next time on the Digital Download.